Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani and today we're going to be learning about bacteria. Now, for a long time, before microscopes were invented, scientists thought that nature was actually made up of only those organisms that we can see. But today we know better. We know that at least two-thirds of life on Earth is actually made up of microorganisms, and most of them are bacteria. To help you picture just how tiny bacteria are, I want you to look at this picture of the head of a pin under the electron microscope. See all those gross looking blobs? Those are individual bacteria cells. Turns out that you can fit over a million bacteria on the head of a pin. So what are bacteria? Bacteria are microscopic single-celled prokaryotic organisms that thrive in a huge variety of environments. Let's break it down. They're made of prokaryotic cells. That means that they have no nucleus or any other organelles at least none that are surrounded by a membrane. And they are microscopic, which means that we can only view them under the microscope. So this picture at the bottom is something called a petri dish. It's just a plastic dish used by scientists to grow bacteria. Bacteria cells can only be seen with a powerful microscope, but when millions of them are gathered in a group, we call them a colony. And as seen here, they can actually be visible to the naked eye. In this particular picture, you see a whole bunch of blue bacteria colonies. So a lot of them can be white, they can be yellow, they can be orange, there can be a variety of colors. So it's pretty neat. Now when most of us think of bacteria, we think of diseases. However, unlike viruses, whose only purpose is to cause disease, bacteria have actually many different functions in our world. As a matter of fact, the majority of the bacteria species in the world do not cause disease. For example, the soil is teeming with bacteria. And yes, yeah, some of them can be dangerous, like the soil bacteria that causes a disease called tetanus, but many of them are actually extremely important for plant life. For example, without nitrogen-fixing bacteria that take nitrogen out of the air and then put it in the soil, plants would not be able to make proteins. The bacteria in the soil start the process going of fixing nitrogen from the air and into some sort of organic compound like proteins. There are about a billion bacteria in a single liter of ocean water. Most of them play an extremely important job in maintaining not just the ocean ecosystems, but those of the entire Earth. For example, about 20% of the oxygen we breathe is actually produced by a single species of ocean bacteria called Prochlorococcus. There are many other species of ocean bacteria that produce oxygen. So that's an extremely important function bacteria have that make oxygen for us. In this picture, you can see a completely different type of ocean bacteria, but it's one of the neatest ones around. It is called Photobacterium phosphorium, and it's a bioluminescent species of bacteria that actually glows in the dark. And bacteria can even live in extreme environments like geysers and hot springs. Some bacteria can even survive the temperatures of up to 120 degrees Celsius that are, can be found in some geysers. It's pretty cool. And did you know that there are more bacteria cells on and in the human body than human cells? We call them our microbiome. And scientists are learning more and more just how much of our microbiomes affect our health. For example, Turns out that bacteria that can live in our skin are responsible not just for causing things like acne and body odor, but can also help us fight harmful infections by fungi. And it turns out that the bacteria in our gut can influence the nutrients we absorb, can influence our immune system, and can even influence our brains. Scientists are actually discovering that gut bacteria can make these compounds called neuroactive compounds. That means compounds that affect our brains chemically including 90% of our neurotransmitter called serotonin. And that is the brain chemical that affects our emotions. So the bacteria in your gut can actually affect your emotions and how you feel. Bacteria can also be important to us because they help us make certain types of food. For example, cheese, yogurt, soy sauce, kimchi, and other types of foods like that would not be possible without fermentation. And that fermentation is usually done through a species of bacteria called Lactobacillus bacteria. So there are millions of different species of bacteria and they come in a variety of different shapes. But there are three main basic bacteria shapes. The first one is the spherical bacteria. 
The second one is more like a rod-like shape, more like tiny little pills. And the last one looks a little bit like worms, and they're a, called they're called a spiral shape. But that's actually not the names that we give them. There are scientific names for these three shapes. And the names are cocci for the spherical bacteria, bacilli for the rod-like bacteria, and spirilli for the spiral bacteria. And a variety of different types of bacteria can be spherical. They can come in pairs or in singles. They can come in chains. They can come in clusters. The paired bacteria and single bacteria can also come as rod-like or bacilli bacteria. And the bacilli bacteria can also come in chains. Or they sometimes can have little tiny tails called flagella. And there can also be some variety with the spiral bacteria and the specific shapes in which they come. Now, often bacteria are given names uh, that are based on their shape. So, for example, the prefix diplo means two or pairs. And a common form of pneumonia is caused by diplococcus pneumoniae. And as you can see in this diagram, it looks like a pair of spheres. So, diplo for two and coccus for sphere. The prefix strepto means twisted chain, and an infection that you might be familiar with called strep throat is actually caused by a bacteria called streptococcus pyogenes. And strep because of the chains, and again coccus because of the spheres. And the prefix staphylo refers to clusters, so the bacterium staphylococcus aureus causes a variety of different skin infections including boils and some other sometimes very dangerous skin infections called staph infections. You might have heard about staph infections perhaps. Well, they're caused by the Staphylococcus aureus and the name Staphylococcus tells us that they are spheres but they're found in clusters. Despite their different shapes though, there are structures that are common to most bacteria. So what we're going to do is we're going to label some of the main parts of a bacteria cell and just talk about those structures. So let's start on the inside. All bacteria contain genetic information in the form of DNA. This DNA is mostly organized into a single circular chromosome found in a region called the nucleot region. This is not a nucleus. It's called the nucleot region because it's a section of the cytoplasm where the DNA is found, but it does not have a membrane like a nucleus does. The inside of the cell also contains tiny structures called ribosomes, which are responsible for making proteins for the bacterium based on the information that is coded on the DNA. And surrounding the cell is the fatty plasma membrane made out of a phospholipid bilayer. And like all plasma membranes, its job is to control what goes in and out of the cell. And the plasma membrane is surrounded by a cell wall. And now, unlike the cell walls of plants, which are made out of something called cellulose, which is a sugar, the cell walls of bacteria are made out of a sugar protein combo molecule called peptidoglycan. And some bacteria also have a sugary capsule that surrounds that cell wall. And that's actually pretty useful for bacteria. It is used to stick to surfaces and cells, and it can also be used for... Um, protection. Bacteria cells with a capsule tend to be a little bit more pathogenic. That means that they're a little bit more disease causing because they're harder to kill by our immune system. That capsule sort of gives the bacteria uh, the ability to survive our immune system a little bit better. Not all bacteria have a capsule, but those that do tend to be a little bit harder to kill by, our, by the immune systems of animals. Some bacteria also have extensions on their surfaces that kind of look like hair. They're called pili, and these are actually used for exchanging DNA with other bacteria. They connect with other bacteria with these little extensions, forming a sort of a bridge between them, and they exchange genes. And finally, some bacteria have one or more little tail-like extensions called flagella. Flagella are used by the bacteria to swim around. You hear the words flagella and flagellum used. Flagella is, means many of them. Flagellum is just a single one. And so some bacteria have just one. Some bacteria actually can have many flagella that they use for movement. One method scientists use to classify bacteria is to stain them with a purple dye called crystal violet dye. And that dye can react with the cell walls of the bacteria. So depending on the complexity of the cell wall and the amount of peptidoglycan molecule present, 
either more or less of the dye will be absorbed by the bacterial cells. So the first type of bacteria is called gram-positive bacteria. And bacteria that are gram-positive bacteria have simple cell walls that also have lots of peptide or glycan. And because of that, they can absorb more of the dye and get stained really deep purple. And the other type of bacteria is called the gram-negative bacteria. And gram-negative bacteria tend to have a very little cell wall and it's a little bit more complex. And so there's a little bit less peptidoglycan on it. And they appear, because of that, they appear light pink because the peptidoglycan cannot absorb the dye as well and tend to be more pathogenic or more disease-causing. So this diagram helps explain how this works. Notice how the gram-positive cell has kind of a thick cell wall that is fully exposed. This thick cell wall can absorb a lot of that violet dye, and that's why the cells appear purple. Now the cell on the bottom picture, the gram-negative bacteria, has a thin layer of peptidoglycan that can absorb the dye, and that thin layer is actually surrounded by two fatty membranes. There's the plasma membrane beneath the layer of peptidoglycan cell wall, but there's also another layer on top, an outer membrane. And because of that outer membrane, less purple dye can be absorbed by the cell, and the cell then appears pink in color instead of purple. This outer membrane also gives the bacteria some sort of protection and makes them harder to kill, which is what makes gram-negative bacteria a little bit more pathogenic or quite a bit more pathogenic or disease-causing than gram-positive bacteria. So next I want to talk about how bacteria reproduce. And honestly, that is one of the most fascinating things about bacteria. And one of the most dangerous ones is how fast bacteria can reproduce. And that is because bacteria reproduce very simply through a process called binary fission. And binary fission is a form of asexual reproduction that involves very few steps. During binary fission, the bacteria cell simply grows, usually just gets longer, and makes a copy of its DNA. And then once it's long enough and the DNA has been copied, it just grows the cell wall in between the two, the middle of the cell, in between the two copies of the DNA, and splits in two, just like that. And the process can take as little as 20 minutes to complete, which as you can see in the short video, it can make bacteria reproduce pretty quickly. Now to be fair, the video has been sped up because obviously we're not gonna sit here and watch for over three hours because if every cell division is going to be 20 minutes, it would take a long time to watch all the cell divisions that happen in this video. But even sped up, you can see how fast this process ha is happening. So in this video, you can see only 10 rounds of reproduction. We started with two bacteria cells. Guess how many bacteria there are after 10 rounds of reproduction? Just 10 cycles. Over 4,000 bacteria cells. Starting with two, with a reproduction time of every 20 minutes, you can end up with 4,000 cells in just three hours. Now, 20 minutes after that is 8,000. 20 minutes after that is 16,000. This is what we call exponential growth, and bacteria can increase in numbers fairly quickly because of that. Now, bacteria do reproduce what we call asexually, which means that a single bacteria makes copies or clones of itself. But from time to time, bacteria just like to exchange genes with one another. And they do this through a process called conjugation. And during conjugation, small pieces of bacterial DNA called plasmids, these are pieces of DNA that are not part of the main bacterial chromosome. Usually bacteria might have several of these tiny little circular pieces of DNA that might contain just maybe one or two genes. And they like to share them with each other. So what will happen is if a bacteria cell encounters another bacterial cell, it could be from the same species, but not necessarily, it could be from a different species, a bac the bacteria will then join together and will form a bridge called a pilus between them. Remember we talked about how bacteria have sometimes, they have those little hair-like uh, structures on their surface called pili? Well, when they join together, that's what it's called. It's called a pilus. And those can attach from one bacteria to another and form that bridge. And you can see in this picture right here, this is actually a microscope photograph of two bacteria forming that bridge between them. 
in real life, not a diagram that has been drawn. And so this process is actually very concerning because oftentimes the genes found in these plasmids give bacteria extra survival abilities. And one of the most concerning things about that is that sometimes those genes are genes for antibiotic resistance. So these are genes that make bacteria not be able to be killed by antibiotics. And so when one bacteria becomes antibiotic resistant, that means that it develops the ability to survive an antibiotic, it can actually pass that gene on to other bacteria through conjugation. The video that I'm posting for you to watch is called Hunting the Nightmare Bacteria, and it talks about superbugs and the incidence of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And it talks about this process briefly, about how the fight against superbugs is made much more difficult when conjugation allows bacteria to share these anti antibiotic resistant genes. Now let's take a look at some diseases that are caused by bacteria. Obviously there are many diseases that can be caused by bacteria, but we're just going to focus on a few. And we're going to start with a disease called cholera, which is caused by a bacterium called Vibrio cholera. And cholera is an infection of the small intestine that causes between mild to extremely severe and very watery diarrhea. In many cases, especially in poorer countries when people don't have access to medical care, cholera can lead to death by dehydration very easily. And cholera is more common in places with poor sanitation because it is usually transmitted by food or water contaminated by feces. So cases of it in Canada are extremely rare and is most often found in places where they have dirty water or where the cholera outbreaks have happened that make it more likely for people who are handling food to pass it on to other people. And cholera outbreaks are actually more common right after disasters or wars and any kind of situation which can basically lead to very poor sanitation. For example, there was a big outbreak of cholera in Haiti that started about 10 months after the 2010 earthquake that devastated that country. And it continues up until this day, and in the t since about 2010, more than 9,000 people have actually died of cholera in Haiti. So, as you can see, it can be a very devastating disease. Another disease that causes diarrhea but is much less dangerous is salmonella. And salmonella is often found in chicken and eggs, but it is killed by heat. So the danger lies when you eat chicken or eggs that are undercooked or other foods that have come in contact with the bacteria. So for example, if you cut your salad greens using the same cutting board as you cut up your raw chicken, then that is one of the ways by which salmonella can spread because you're transferring the salmonella bacteria, which is killed by heat, to a food substance that you're not gonna heat up, like your salad. Oftentimes when people are using or working with raw chicken, they wash their hands very often, they wash all their utensils with lots of soap and water because those are the ways by which you can kill the bacteria other than obviously cooking your food very well. A disease that you might also be familiar with is strep throat. Many of you may have actually gotten strep throat at one point and you might be familiar with that on a more personal level. A strep throat is very very contagious and it spreads very easily through the air and through saliva and the strep bacteria that infects the cells of your throat cause an infection that usually presents with a fever, swollen glands, difficulty swallowing like extreme difficult and pain swallowing but also a very, very extremely irritated sore throat that tends to have these little white patches on it. And it's actually one of the ways by which doctors diagnose it. You know how when you go to the doctors, when you have a sore throat, they ask you to open up and say, ah? They are looking for inflammation of the throat, but also signs of strep, because strep throat has some very characteristic white patches that are usually not seen with viral throat infections. So you can see the picture at the bottom there, you can see the little white patches, that's strep. A disease that you might hear more about in the spring and summer is called Lyme disease. And that is because Lyme disease is transmitted to people by tick bites. So it's more common when the weather is nicer and people venture out into the woods or fields. And the ticks don't cause the disease, the ticks pass the bacteria on to people and the bacteria is what causes the disease. So Lyme disease symptoms can start with common flu-like symptoms like fever, chills, headache, 
But what can make it more obvious is this rash that a lot of people get that is called a bullseye rash. And this rash usually appears about 14 days after the initial bite. And complications can also occur with Lyme disease beyond just the rash and the flu-like symptoms. And most often the complications of Lyme disease is arthritis. After several months of infection, about 30 to 60% of people who, especially those who are not treated with antibiotics, can develop recurrent attacks of very painful swollen joints that can last from a few days to a few months to maybe even years. And this arthritis can shift usually from one joint to another, but for some reason is more common in the knee joint. And that's a few diseases. So let's talk about how we can treat bacterial infections and how we treat them is through antibiotics. Now, antibiotics are chemicals that can kill bacteria, usually by either killing them directly or by stopping the reproduction. And they can prevent bacteria, for example, from turning sugar into energy. They can prevent bacteria from building their proteins, or they can prevent bacteria from making a cell wall. So those are some of the typical ways by which different types of antibiotics can kill bacteria. For example, penicillin, which is a very common antibiotic, prevents the formation of cell walls. And so by preventing bacteria from forming a cell wall, it prevents them from reproducing. Most antibiotics actually come from mold. They come from fungi and sometimes also from soil bacteria. So most antibiotics actually come from living things and we we extract these products out of living things that actually produce them as their own defense against bacterial infections. So the antibiotics themselves, like for example, a fungi's own immune system against bacteria, they produce them in order for them to defend themselves against bacterial infections so we can take advantage of that and purify the compound that kills the bacteria and use it to make medicine. And I want to reiterate once again that antibiotics do not work on viruses. So they can only work on bacterial infections. So if you have a cold or a flu, COVID-19, or any kind of other viral infection, antibiotics are not going to work. As a matter of fact, they can make things worse because they can kill the natural bacteria that you have in your body that helps keep you healthy. And it certainly won't kill the viruses, but it can definitely affect your health. But also, because sometimes bacteria can develop antibiotic resistance. And one of the ways that they can do that is when we use them too much. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about antibiotic resistant bacteria or something that we sometimes call superbugs. And so some types of bacteria, what has happened is they have responded to our use of antibiotics by basically becoming resistant to them. In this particular slide, you see a photograph there. The photograph here shows two Petri dishes. The bacteria on the Petri dishes is the white part on the Petri dishes. And each Petri dish has also a set of seven numbered little discs that have been dipped in antibiotics, different types of antibiotics. So on the Petri dish on the left, you can see that each antibiotic disc is surrounded by a clear area. That's actually good. That means that each antibiotic has managed to kill the bacteria in that area. The Petri dish on the right, on the other hand, has a few discs that did not manage to kill any bacteria. And so the bacteria that grew on the right Petri dish was actually not killed at all by antibiotics number two, five, and seven, and killed only a little bit by antibiotics three and four. The only two antibiotics that actually work fully on killing this bacteria was antibiotics one and six. So out of seven antibiotics, only two of them were fully effective at killing that bacteria. So that type of bacteria here on the right is called a superbug. That is a bacteria that is resistant to many different types of antibiotics. That means that antibiotics do not kill that bacteria. In this particular case, only two types of antibiotics will kill the bacteria. So let's say you got an infection uh, from a bacteria and you were infected by the strain on the left that was killed by all the different antibiotics. You go to the doctors, you get diagnosed with a bacterial infection. Let's say, for example, maybe you had an ear infection. And the doctor's like, okay, I'm going to prescribe you some antibiotics. You take the antibiotics. And it doesn't matter which antibiotic the doctor prescribes you. 
any of those seven that are on that petri dish will easily kill the bacteria and you'll get better and so if you say for example like are allergic to penicillin you'll get a I don't know, erythromycin or some other antibiotic, and you'll be fine. You'll be able to kill that bacteria with any of those antibiotics. But on the other hand, if you get an infection with the bacteria strain that's on the right, then the doctor might give you an antibiotic. Let's say it gives you antibiotic number five, and the infection continues to get worse. The bacteria is not killed by antibiotic. Then the doctor might try another one and another one and another one. And so this is when bacterial infections can get really, really dangerous. More information about antibiotic-resistant bacteria can be found in that video that I posted for this week, The Hunting the Nightmare Bacteria, and you'll get to see a few case studies of situations where individuals have been followed who had been infected by antibiotic-resistant bacteria, and you can see how terrible that can be. So what causes this? And turns out that the rise of this antibiotic resistant bacteria is actually our own fault. The rise of antibiotic resistant and superbugs can be blamed on a few things that humans have done. And the first is farming practices. Turns out that massive, massive amounts of antibiotics are given to farm animals. About 80% of the antibiotics that are used in the U.S., for example, are actually consumed by farm animals, mostly pigs, chickens, and cattle. And only about 20% of the antibiotics used in the United States are consumed by humans. I don't have any Canadian statistics, but I think they're similar to those. And so this overuse of antibiotics in farming has basically let, uh, provided a breeding ground where bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics because they're exposed to them so often. Another reason why antibiotic resistant bacteria have proliferated so much is due to the misuse and the overuse of antibiotics by humans. So for example, let's say you prescribe antibiotics and you take them, but then you feel better. So you don't take the whole course. Maybe you're given antibiotics that should last you 10 days and you're told to take them three times a day for 10 days. But then after day five, you feel better, and so then you forget to take them in day six, and then by day seven, you just throw them out. Well, by not taking the entire course of antibiotics, that actually also promotes the proliferation of hardier, more resistant bacteria. Sometimes also the fault lies with the overprescription of antibiotics. This is getting better, but for a long, long time, doctors were overprescribing antibiotics and often prescribing them for viral diseases as opposed to bacterial diseases. Not because doctors didn't know that viruses were not killed by antibiotics, but because when a person went to the doctor's office and they had an infection, the symptoms usually cannot pinpoint a bacteria or a viral infection. You present with a sore throat, your sore throat could be caused by a virus. Or by a bacteria. You present with um, an ear infection, it could be viral, it could be bacterial. And the process of taking a swab, sending the sample in from the, to the lab, waiting for the results to come back, that's time consuming and it would require a separate appointment for you to come back to get the results before you got an antibiotic prescription. So in order to save time, doctors would just prescribe antibiotics and send you off to take them just in case the disease happened to be bacterial. And so all of these sort of practices in which people were misusing antibiotics, overusing them, um, overprescribing them, have basically led to this resistance of antibiotic resistance by bacteria because they can evolve that resistance. Um, you can see this picture right here. What this is showing is that when antibiotics are used, the bacteria that are killed are the ones that are not resistant to antibiotics, which actually leaves behind maybe just the, the few bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, but now those bacteria now can grow and, and divide without the competition of the other bacteria. And so now the bacteria that has become more common because we've killed the ones that were killed by antibiotics, are the ones that cannot be killed by antibiotics. And on top of that, if you have those bacteria sharing their antibiotic-resistant genes with other 
bacteria with the bacteria that could be killed and you're sharing them through conjugation. Now we're transferring the, the antibiotic resistance from resistant bacteria to non-resistant bacteria, making those new bacteria also resistant. And so the process is just continuous. So this horizontal gene transfer, that's what we call that, that conjugation where genes for antibiotic resistance are passed from um, resistant bacteria to non-resistant bacteria, that has also added to the problem of superbugs and antibiotic resistance. And so I want to just end with this cute little cartoon or comic about antibiotic resistance. And that's where I'll leave you. Have a good day, everybody. Talk to you soon.